My name is Katherine Shield, and I am an instructional designer in academic innovations and e-learning. I'm joined by an accessibility specialist from DSS and Libby Roderick from CAFE. This is what we were planning to talk about today. So looking at what students' needs are and making sure that we're aligned with student learning outcomes and really focusing our assessments now on those crucial needs. So enduring understanding learning for transfer to future courses and other environments and the essential principles in your course. We're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about different ways, alternate ways to assess students and then communicating, how to have a communication plan to make sure that students know all of the changes you've made. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about tools and resources to help you and your students. Our big goals, right, as a university are health and safety first. That goes for students, that goes for instructors, that goes for staff. And then instructional continuity in some form, making sure that we still teach. And in course completion for as many students as possible. We are in a very different reality right now. Schedules and lives are probably going to keep getting harder for the next couple of weeks or month as we have layoffs in the community, as different family members are dealing with illnesses, as the reality of being home all of this time becomes more and more apparent. And so our goal right now is not to make every course as normal as possible. Our goal is to make each course as possible as possible and to help everybody get through this. Our new normal, right, where we are asking everybody to be as flexible as possible. The situation is changing. You don't need to have your final assessments set in stone yet if you're still trying to figure out what's going to work for your students in your class. It's okay to just tell them that. We are asking instructors to avoid proctored exams. So please do not try to find an outside proctoring solution. The provost has announced that we are not expanding the remote proctoring service to alternate delivery courses. That's going to be reserved only for courses that were already using that service. Because we have students with a lot of technology challenges right now, students that don't have access to internet, that don't um, have computers that are set up for these tools, and we're trying to really limit their exposure to limit the people coming to campus and to plan for the possibility that campus may have a hard closure at some point. So we'll talk about other ways to do exams in this. We are asking faculty to stick to Blackboard as their primary mode of communication with students and to use other UAA core tools. So that's your, your Google for Education Suite, Google Docs, those things, that's Zoom, which we're using now. Um, things that UAA supports, things that students will use across different courses so that they're not trying to learn 30 new technologies at a time when they're under a lot of stress. And a lot of those tools are acting weird as demand increases. We are asking faculty to have an asynchronous option to have something that students can do if they don't have reliable, regular, or high-speed computer access, if they're just you know, checking in on Blackboard occasionally on Wi-Fi and trying to do that work on their own and then upload it, please assume that students won't, have, won't always have reliable access. Assume that students won't have consistent schedules, that as different employers respond to this, students' schedules may change, even if they're available now. If you are doing synchronous activities, please use the time slot for your course. But we are asking people to try to have that asynchronous do on your own time option. When we talk about assessments, we would like you to plan for a low tech option and a way to help students that don't have those tools and a plan that you will need to come up with accommodations for students with disabilities. We have students that have not disclose their disabilities because the old way of delivering courses worked for them and they didn't need to do that. And I know that a lot of them are working with DSS now to try to get changes, 
but I also know that there are a lot of students who are just overwhelmed and trying to tough things out for as long as they can. So the more flexible you are and the more you plan to accommodate students who can't do things in a particular way from the beginning, the easier that's going to be. So in terms of what we do with the new normal, we're asking people to prioritize students as much as possible. If you can, give them a choice of how they complete your course and what those assessments look like. So having maybe a synchronous option and an asynchronous option, right? Do a presentation in Zoom with the class if you can, or do something and submit it online if you can't. We're asking, sort of we are encouraging people to think about having more generous late policies than usual. Um, to think about what you need to grade for performance and how well students did and where really if they're completing it, if they're making a good effort, that's what you want to focus on right now. I know instructors are under a lot of stress too and so completion grading can be a way to reduce the pressures on instructors as well as on students. Because my background includes language instruction, I do want to point out that one of the first things to go under stress is memorization and the ability to acquire large amounts of vocabulary or large amounts of concepts. So I would encourage people to particularly think in terms of completion and cutting some of these things down if it's a memorization focused course as opposed to processing doing activities. And I want to remind people that you do have incompletes for flexibility at the end of the semester. Do not hesitate to give students incompletes if they need more time to complete those activities. I just wanted to flag the fact that I am hearing slightly different messages from different places and I'm trying to clarify um, exactly what people's policy is on giving people incompletes. I've gotten different messages from different places, some of them saying to be very restricted about the use of that and others being uh, much more generous. So I'll just flag that here and uh, maybe people can confirm things with their own departments about how they're proceeding in that regard. Definitely. If you're getting mixed messages, check with your department. I know that the normal policy on incompletes is that students need to have completed the majority of the work for the semester. And that's a space where we should be, if students have been up to date through spring break, that's where we should be with our students. I know that they have encouraged us to make the incompletes a little more flexible this year, and that there has been some discussion about ways that students would be able to complete those courses next semester, that that might be a little more flexible than it has been in the past. But definitely, I think we're gonna see clearer policy in the next week or two. And fortunately, incomplete grades aren't something that we have to decide in the next week or two. The other thing here that I would encourage you to do is to ask students what they need to check in with them and see both what's most important for them to learn if with the rest of the semester, what they know they are going to need in the future, and also what they need to make that learning possible for them. We don't expect you to guess at your student situations or to read their minds. So asking them is a great way to keep that open and make sure that you're helping students. When it comes to adapting to the normal, students come first and then your student learning outcomes. So start with the core, the heart of your course, and what, even in a normal semester, what would you expect students to know or to understand two or three years from now? What do you really want them to keep? That's something that you want to make sure stays in your course, that enduring understanding. Other thing that's really important to keep in your course are the official course description student learning outcomes. If you aren't intimately familiar with your official course description, you can just Google UAA and CIM, C-I-M, or UAA and CCGs. Um, but you want to make sure that you have those official outcomes. And for most instructors, those outcomes are already on the syllabus. I hope for all instructors, but realistically for most instructors. And you want to make sure that those outcomes are still in your course and to check which ones have not yet been assessed in your course. If you have an outcome that you were planning to assess multiple ways at different stages, 
but you've already done it one way, then it's maybe not the biggest priority. If you expanded on those outcomes for your course design, this might be a time to cut back to the bare bones. The last thing to consider is to check what students need from your course to stay on track for their majors and programs. And this is particularly important in some programs where there are accreditation concerns outside accrediting bodies, like medical programs, they may need a specific skill from your course to move on to the next level in the fall. Once you've done that, then we're looking at how do we align those outcomes. And it really is pretty simple. You make sure you know what outcomes you need to assess. You focus your assessment so that you're really only targeting those new narrower outcomes. You make sure that the materials, the activities, the readings, everything you're doing in your class is supporting those assessments. And then you make sure that students know what you're assessing and why. Again, and this is one of the core messages that we are getting from the provost and the chancellor, try to keep it simple. Focus on that core of your course. Change your expectations. It's okay to cut things from your course. It's okay to change things, to change your readings, to change the topics, to change the assessments. This doesn't mean that you should stop expecting anything from your students. We do intend to teach for the rest of the semester. But it means that you should focus your expectations on what's most important. Communicate clearly. Keep your students in the loop. And then finally, don't try to do the impossible. Some disciplines are, cannot use alternate delivery because it violates their accreditation standards. So some medical fields, for example, I, I mentioned those earlier, there are courses where, you know, if you are not showing that you are using the correct amount of pressure when doing CPR, you may not be able to continue a EMT course. And if you are in one of those fields, please work with your department, work with the dean to make arrangements for your students. We're aware that not every course can go fully online and we don't expect people to do the impossible. Finally, as part of that big picture for the assessments, think about reweighting the grading for your semester. Assessing all of those student learning outcomes isn't the same thing as weighting them all equally. If you had a semester where the final was most of the grade, but you've already done other activities, you've done paper, you've done a midterm, you've done these other things, it's okay to say that we're going to weight the stuff that you already did more heavily. We're going to focus on reflection activities, lower stakes assessments for the remainder of the semester. One way to do this is to think about doing midterm plus grading. If you've had a lot of graded activities, to say that as long as you complete the rest of the activities and make a reasonable effort, your grade can go up from the midterm, but it's not going to go down. That works for some classes, it completely fails for others, but it's something to think about. Another one is to say if students complete the remaining work and are active in discussions and are, do the short assignments or projects or whatever we have, then the final is going to be optional. You can take the grade that you have going into the final, or you can decide to take the final in an effort to raise your grade. That's another structure that works well for some courses. I know that even face-to-face -face classes, some math courses have used that structure, for example. Okay, then we'll look at ways to change your assessments. Here are some things that you can use to replace in-class activities, ways to sort of show that learning. You could ask students to record a demo of an activity. That could be record your dance or a piece of a dance, record music to, if we don't have the tools, go out and survey the yard or survey part of your block using a pencil and dental floss to pretend that they're the tools to show this is what you would do, to fake a step-by-step -step lab with kitchen items. So the, now I'm going to pour this water, pretending it's the reagent into a coffee cup, pretending that it is in fact our beaker. But any sort of recording like that, again, this is something that you would wanna give students options for those who don't have the ability to make video recordings, but it can be a good way to extend that class. Um, you can ask students to do something and photograph it, scan it, and share it with you that way. And this could be not make a model from toilet paper tubes, because that may be a sore spot, but drawing something out or solving math problems on paper and then taking a photo of that or a scan of that and uploading it. 
you can ask them to write or to record audio describing how to do something or talking about how they feel about the readings or describing their sort of step by step as I do this, you know, as I solve the problem, then I'm going to take the remainder and I'm going to put it here and then I'm going to and so to create something that shows how they're doing the work rather than just doing the work and showing the result. In some cases, you could ask them to teach a household member or if they do have access to Zoom to teach somebody else online and record that interaction or record that person doing the task or summarizing what they now know about the Spanish Inquisition. I know nobody expects that. And then have them reflect on how that went, either writing again or recording. You can ask them to create maps, concept maps, flow charts, drawings, diagrams, infographics, all kinds of ways that they would sort of process this information normally with other people or in a presentation, but now might be a time to just show what they would do for a process or a project or an idea or an activity. Um, if students are going to share this with the class in a discussion board or another format, ask them to include an explanation or a text only version in the assignment. That way you have the accessibility component for other students. Another thing is to have students watch a recording of somebody else doing it and critique them. So watch a sample class or watch a theater piece and say, well, here's how I would light it differently or here's what I would do differently and develop it that way. If we're looking at old assessments and how do we adapt them, one is to see if you can take sort of a chunk of it instead of the whole thing. Another would be to use a sample data set or a mock activity. So if, for example, students would normally design an experiment, conduct the experiment, and then write up an experiment saying, well, I'm going to have them write up or do a recording of how, of how they would design the experiment and what they would do, and then I'm going to give them a different experiment and a sample data set, and they're going to write up that one instead. That might be a way to focus it in and make it possible. Another great tool is reflection and projection, reflect and project activities. So have them write about or record something talking about, here's what I did, here's what I would have done instead in a normal semester, or, or here's what I was planning to do. And then here's how I could still use what I've learned from this in the future. So projecting future uses for what they're doing or the skill they're practicing or the knowledge they're gaining. And that projection is a really nice piece because it helps them remember why they're doing all of this. You can consider asking students to write up proposals of what they would do or how they would do things or the paper they would write if they had infinite time and all the resources in the library. You can also, instead of doing an exam, ask students to write possible exam questions on each of the different topics with answers. So here's the exam question that I think you should ask and here's how I would answer that question, which forces them to think through both sides of the equation. If you're creating new assessments, again, I encourage you to ask your students. They might have great ideas for things that could replace an exam or a large project or paper. Um, and if you have a couple of different good ideas that they suggest, see if, you know, different groups of students want to do different ones. Another new assessment, think about what's happening now like a historian. Or here's a current news article, what are the scientific principles that they're using or that they're relying on, where are the mistakes? Or write a reflection on what you think the impacts of COVID-19 are going to be on this professional discipline. How are accounting firms dealing with this? And what are the impacts likely to be in the next year? How are air traffic managers dealing with this? Right? What are those impacts? These are things people are thinking about now. And so it might be appropriate to bring that into your class. If you're asking students to do things that are different, like create videos or do different projects or do role playing things, it's really helpful to reward that responsible risk taking. So saying, well, you know, everybody who can do it, try and create a video. And if it fails, you can write a reflection paper that says, here's what I tried to do. Here's what worked. Here's what didn't. Here's what I tried differently and submit that for the grade so that there's less stress writing on how good of a video can I make? How good of a presentation can I do under these circumstances? Because students know that they have some of those options. 
and I know I keep saying choices, 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 but I feel like right now people are trying to figure out what's going to work for them. And the more you can put those choices on their students, the less you have to figure out the one best way to teach your course. The other part of choices, Catherine, is that it also gives the students the ability to go, okay, this is good to still be the least stressful thing for me um, and still get out what I need to do rather than, oh my gosh, now I have to learn this whole new thing that doesn't have anything to do with the learning outcomes. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Heather. This is a course where an exam makes a lot of sense. How do I keep that happening? First thing is if you are adapting an exam, in some cases, you can do it as go do this in a Google document or as a Microsoft document and then upload. But a lot of times the easiest format is going to be to do it as a Blackboard test. And we have a video on the basics of how to create a test. And there's a workshop tomorrow at one on converting paper tests to Blackboard tests. And we should have some sort of a recording from that or on that topic up next week. Second, again, refocus on those core learning outcomes and pare it down. People are really overwhelmed and trying to find large blocks of time is harder than it used to be. Prepare students for the content and the types of questions that are going to be on the exam. So having a study guide or a practice test or, you know, here's a list of 10 possible essay questions and I will ask you two of them. That sort of thing can really help. And when you're trying to figure out how long an exam takes, Budget more time than you normally would for student writing and problem solving. Just assume that everybody is stressed and thinking a little more slowly than normal. I know I am. In terms of how to make that work, most of these, if not all of these, treat them as open book. So limit the questions more to things that ask students to apply their knowledge, to explain something, to describe it analyze it to justify why we were doing it the way we are or why this happened, to evaluate things, to compare things, do a little bit more of those higher level thinking skills. And that way it's much harder to just copy an answer from somewhere. You could even for this, for an open book where you have knowledge checks, say, you know, right now I'm not expecting you to memorize everything, but I just want you to give the information and give the page number where you found it and acknowledge that it is in fact an open book assessment. Another thing you can do is ask students to create and upload their personal notes that they're going to use for the exam because that helps them synthesize the information before they take it. You can create a closed book exam and ask students to complete an honor pledge and we'll have some resources for that in our guide. This is something that doesn't work with every student but a lot of students, if you explain the situation you're in and you ask them to be responsible, to help you and to help each other and pledge their honor saying that they are doing this as a closed book exam, most students will in fact do it. Another thing to consider as you're adapting exams is if you do have students who have connectivity issues, internet issues, or computer access issues, or students who have accessibility issues, where perhaps they can't stare at a screen for two hours. You could consider giving those students oral exams. And oral exams are something that are common in a lot of countries, but not really the United States, except for things like PhD exams, quals. But if you're taking a written exam and trying to convert it to an oral, basically ask a subset of the questions and then you can ask follow-up questions if you wanna make sure that they understand their answer or if you're not sure. But the reason I say subset is that if they know a topic, if it sounds like they've got this, you can just go ahead and sort of cut them off and be like, that's great, you know that stuff, move on. So in this case, you would probably be doing these over the phone or in some cases where students perhaps can access the internet, they just can't stare at a screen, you might do it over Zoom or another tool like that so that they're not looking at the screen, but they're filling it out. And what you can do with these is actually save the exam as a copy or have that where you're actually filling out the exam as you talk to them. And so you have a record of what their answers were. In general, if you can record the session, do that. Otherwise, 
don't just take notes that say, well, they got an A on this question or, oh, this question they failed. Take notes that shows what they answered so that you have that as a grading record. And I think under the circumstances, it is fine to say this is an alternative format for students who need it to complete the course. This is not something that you necessarily have to extend to all of your students. And honestly, if you tell students, hey, guess what? You have a choice between this open book exam and you can take, you know, two hours to do it, or we can have a conversation and I'm going to grill you. Most students will take the written option. And the students that say, no, I would rather have you grill me, are students who have a good reason to do that. So even if they don't have all of the documentation, that's probably going to work to sort of limit that time and your attention to the students who need that format. And this type of oral exam is also something that you can do for STEM courses. If students can't scan and upload their work, you can do, again, in a limited manner, but the, okay, here's a time, call me, just walk me through your problem set. What did you do for this problem? What did you do for that problem? Great, I'll take that as a submission. And that's something that students can't do on the fly. They would have to write out the work in advance, but it can be faster for them to talk you through it than to spend two hours trying to get an outdated phone to somehow take a picture that's the right quality that they can somehow get to Blackboard and upload. Okay, moving on to presentations. If possible, if at all possible, give students the choice between pre-recording their presentations or doing them live. So they could record video, they could do PowerPoint slides and just record audio with them. They could do a screencast. And we do have a video that show, talks about how to use Screencast-O-Matic and how to use Kaltura within Blackboard to capture videos. And those are both tools that students can use. They can record up to 15 minutes on Screencast-O-Matic, and they can use the Kaltura tool within Blackboard the same way that an instructor would. Also, if you've worked with VoiceThread before, you could use that for student presentations. For live ones, this would be if you were doing class sessions, you could have them take turns presenting. Or you might say, you know, if a couple of students can get together and record a smaller Zoom session presenting to each other, just send me that recording. Either way, for the, if you're doing live presentations with students, give them a chance to practice with the tool before they're actually trying to work with the tool and the content. So set up a practice session or have a Zoom room that's open that students can go in and try. Right now, Zoom has changed the default settings so that student participants can't automatically share their screen. And that is a response, as best I understand, to some problems that they were seeing at the national level. So that's something to just double check in your settings if you're going to ask students to present slides during a Zoom session. You would want to go in to your settings in alaska.zoom.us and make sure that students have the ability to share their screen. Another thing would be to ask students to do slides or do a handout to do something so that if they're sharing their presentation with the class, that students who can't attend that class can still get that information, get that content, and participate. I would also encourage you, I know a lot of our instructors do group work and do you know, even team-based learning and do some fantastic things with student collaboration. But right now, when student schedules are overwhelmed, and their things are changing and they can't necessarily say what tomorrow's schedule is going to look like and a lot of people are overwhelmed if it's possible you might want to make that collaboration optional and say students can do an individual project an individual presentation that's smaller or they can work with a group they can work with a team and do the project that we had originally designed but if individual work is all a student can handle it would be great to give that student the ability to complete the course for writing, think about how much writing you need to assess an outcome. In some cases, having an outline of the argument or an annotated bibliography of resources or a close reading of one source might be enough to assess an outcome instead of having the normal large paper. You could provide a set of online sources so they didn't have to do the full research themselves. They could just work with that set of sources that you know are good. Again, thinking about ways to just sort of shorten it a little bit so that students can focus on the key knowledge and skills that they need to practice. Use familiar tools, right? If you're using eWolf and ePortfolio, keep using it. Otherwise, stick to Word or Google Doc and 
if possible, give students a choice. Use familiar formats. So it may be instead of writing a long analytical essay, you have them write a letter to a public figure explaining a position or do a short brochure on a topic. And sort of that language and focusing in on, again, the core of what they need to communicate. And I would focus on communicating ideas as opposed to academic English. I am a common nut. I am very particular about punctuation and proofreading, but right now even I am making a lot of mistakes. And so it's not the best time to put as much weight as normal on how polished a product is, as opposed to whether under normal circumstances they would be able to polish it. And that brings us to this general question of grading. Right now we are trying to grade for learning and for those big ideas, as opposed to all of the details or the word count. And when you're grading things like videos or presentations, try not to penalize students for their circumstances. Maybe there's kid noise in the background. Maybe they submitted the paper late because their internet was down. If they're doing the work, Think of them as being on your team. And so I'm really trying to think of assessment here as something that we do with students. And even grading is something that we do with students and not something that we do to students. As part of that, there are different grading models that you can use. You can say, this is really going to be completion based. I'll give you, you know, a couple of chances to complete it. If you complete it, great, you're done. That's 100%. You can do, and this is something I know instructors who used like a 0, 75, 100 even before this semester to say either you can redo it, but you don't get credit for it right now, or it's good enough, or, you know, this would be a B or A level work. Your boss would accept this as professional work in this particular circumstance, and so that's going to get 100%. And that's, you know, like that sort of 75, 100, a lot of instructors already use this for basic activities as sort of that check, check plus grading. Again, this does not work for everything, but it's something to consider that simplifies your life a little bit, simplifies students' lives a little bit. Self-evaluation can be a great tool to use here. So for example, if you were converting and you're doing a lot of discussion board activities with posts and replies, instead of grading all of those in detail, if you focus on replying to the discussion boards and keeping the conversation going, you could just ask students for a short reflection assignment at the end of the semester that says, here's how much I contributed on the discussion board, here's my favorite post, or here's one that I would totally rewrite, and here's why, and grade that reflection instead of grading all of their activities on the discussion board. Again, that kind of frees you up. This is Katie. I'll just add that I, I found in using self-evaluation that students often grade themselves harsher than I would, um, and I found it to be very effective. When I was teaching writing, and again, this was under normal circumstances, I started doing self-evaluations when students turned in papers, and it saved me so much time because they would write, I did this at the last minute, and it doesn't really have a thesis. I'm not sure this part of the argument hangs together. And then as an instructor, instead of trying to think of how to tactfully tell them that they don't have a thesis, I could write, your analysis is totally correct. You know what you need to do better. And it really transformed that relationship and saved me a lot of time on comments. And some of the national articles on self-evaluation are saying that, you know, instructors frequently see 80 to 90% of their students self-evaluation works great and you don't need to argue with them at all. The only thing you ever do is raise their grade from what they give themselves. So again, that's a way to just cut down the grading and focus it on the students that think they're doing a lot better than they are. If you are doing collaborative projects, you can ask them to evaluate each other and give you some feedback and give each other feedback so that you as the instructor can spend a little bit less time there. Okay, so moving on to communication. Provide very clear instructions to students about assessments. Assume that right now they're having trouble processing information. And if you say write a four to five page paper or create a video, they don't necessarily know what you mean. Give specifics, tell them exactly what you want. Include help or how-to links to things like creating a video. Try following your own directions or ask somebody else in your household to try to follow those directions and see if they get stuck. 
And make sure that you give a very clear timeline and regular reminders to students. Again, everybody's a little overwhelmed right now. So even students that normally would do a great job may just drop the ball because something else comes up or they have you know, seven things on their to-do list and they remembered four of them. Tell students how you're going to grade their work. So make sure that your grading matches the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Tell them what success looks like, and you can use a rubric for this. If possible, give examples. Show a range, like this would be a C paper, this would be an A paper, or here's what I like about this version. This is why, even though it's really rough, I would give it an A, because it manages to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and where I say provide a rubric or a checklist for those grading criteria, one thing that you can also do is to jointly create a rubric with your students to say, here's the activity, I'm taking suggestions for how we grade it. Or let's edit a rubric together because that can help students understand the purpose of the assessment and really focus them on those learning objectives and what you want them to get out of it. As you update your course, as you come up with these new assessments, communicate those changes to students. Make sure they know what the new expectations are. A little bit about why you've changed it or what the rationale is for the expectations that you have kept. Tell them of any choices that they need to make. Make sure they know the timeline, that they've got those instructions, and that they know how you're going to evaluate them. So we are going to have a more detailed resource guide with some more links. This slide deck, the link for that is bit.ly, so a bit.ly link with that period in the middle, slash UAA underscore capital A assessments. CAFE has a bunch of resources and is compiling more, and we are going to be updating our academic continuity website to point to more of these resources. Academic innovations and e-learning, we are here. We are not just available in terms of what we are putting out, but if you have a particular situation, go ahead and do a consultation with us. We are here to help you. And so just in a quick review, these are the things that we talked about briefly how to adapt the, your ass assessments, making sure that you're meeting those student learning outcomes, setting priorities, some different choices, making sure you communicate those changes, and some resources for getting help. I just want to say thank you. I know that this is a very stressful time for everybody, and particularly for faculty members, and so the fact that you are putting in all of this effort and thought and time into figuring out what's going to work best for your students is I mean, honestly it's kind of awe-inspiring and so thank you for everything that you're doing to make sure that learning is still possible under any circumstances.